Do you want to know more about a spray booth? Why don't you stick around and see how to set the spray booth up in my layout room for the Sayahur Secondary. Hello everyone, Joe from Central Jersey, Conrail and Inscale, and welcome to our first segment of the paint shop. Okay, so what is the paint shop? So the paint shop is gonna be a bi-monthly segment that I'm gonna run, and what I'm gonna do is mostly we're gonna be focusing on uh, freight cars and buildings. Uh, I'm gonna show you how we uh, do our airbrushing, uh, I'm gonna show you how I paint uh, my cars up, how I decal them, um, how I do details and, and weathering. Uh, also, when I uh, get to building some buildings, we'll go over painting buildings and doing um, a weathering with those. So to get uh, everything rolling, we're going to start off slow. And uh, this segment, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how I set up the spray booth uh, for the layout room here on the Sayahur Secondary. Okay, so let's talk about my spray booth. So initially, when I was shopping around, I was looking at a um, already made spray booth uh, through Micromart. And it was a downdraft style uh, spray booth. Now, after further investigating, what I found was I was a little leery of when you have a downdraft, your filter is on the bottom surface of the spray booth. And I was a little leery about, you know, my work stance, how would it stand on the filter, would it teeter over? So, you know, I was kind of looking at possibly doing something different. So then the, uh, the opportunity arose uh, when Bill Graham offered to give me uh, an old spray booth that he had built um, and that he wasn't using anymore. So the spray boot that he gave me was a cross draft style. So what those two terms mean is this. A down draft style means that the uh, underneath the bottom of the spray boot, there's a fan that draws the suction and, and draws the fumes out. That's down draft. And then a cross draft is um, there's a filter in the back and the, the, the uh, blower motors in the back and it pulls the fresh air across the work surface and evacuates all the fumes out the back of it. So that creates a cross draft. So those are the two different styles that I've found. Okay, so after weighing all the options, you know, I really leaned toward the cross draft style uh, because I was really like the idea of a nice solid work surface to put everything down on. Um, and so that's pretty much why it went that way. You know, I'm not picking one or saying one's better than the other because they each have different attributes. So I, I advise you that when you're setting up your spray booth or you know you do the research and decide what what fits your style of modeling so in my research you know i found um there's some people out there that are just doing some really shady stuff and i'm just gonna put it out there and i'm just gonna you know say it like this you know i would take the time if you're gonna be painting in below grade in a basement like I'm doing here to do the research and, and invest in a spray booth because it's it's imperative. You know, some of these paints that you're going to be using, um, some, some of the cleaners and the, the, the solvents, you know, they put off real nasty fumes. And if you're down here for a long exposure type period, um, you're going to be inhaling those and it's not good for you. Uh, I saw some people that were doing like the, the DIY spray booths that were using cardboard boxes and they were using fans from, um, you know, uh, exhaust fans from the bathrooms. And, you know, you really have to sit down and decide what type of medias you're using. Because if you're using an oil-based paint or an enamel-based paint where there's, there's an, a possibility of uh, flammable uh, vapors, you know, you're going to be uh, putting that through a fan that doesn't, uh, that's not capable of handling it. So really weigh all those options and safety is paramount. I mean, you're down here and you, you don't want to get hurt and you don't want to cause a fire. So that's why I really think when you see the, the way I set the spray booth up, I really did a lot of research and some people may watch the video and say, well, you went a little overboard. You didn't need all that. But I, I always think more is better, um, you know, especially when it comes to safety. Okay, so why don't we do this? Um, why don't you go ahead and watch this video and I'll show you how I prep the booth and put it all together and all the different components that I put into it and then we'll come back and I'll sit down and I'll show it to you and we'll talk about it. Okay, so first step getting this booth together was I had to cut, there was a four inch collar on the back of the booth. So I had to cut it off and, and grind it flush. And the reason for that was I needed to have a flat surface on the back to mount the blower to on the back of the booth. Then I took the time to clean up the booth with some wire wheels and sanded it so it was nice and smooth and then I primed it with a self-etching auto primer. So the 
the reason I primed it and painted it is I just wanted to make, look a little nice in the layout room. I just didn't want to be a, a naked steel box. Then I found a nice shade of blue that matched the Conroe color and I painted the outside. The main reason for painting the outside was because it, it is metal, so I didn't want any kind of like corrosion or, or scale on it. So the Dayton blower I got has a built-in collar. So what I had to do is cut that collar on the back side so that the blower motor would fit flush against the spray booth and then I mounted it up. So I went with the centrifugal style blower because the motor is not in the airstream. With the other style of blowers, there may be a possibility of uh, contaminants in the airstream that will build up on the armature of the motor and thus re uh, reducing the life expectancy of the motor of the blower. Now the blower is all mounted and I'm wiring it up and then I plug it in to test it just to make sure that it works. Now I'm building a collar to adapt that square fitting to a 4 inch round for my dryer ducting. I made sure to seal it all up with the luminized tape so there was no leaks. So here I am just testing the airflow and I found some leaks so I went back and resealed it again. So here I am mounting the light in the, in the light bay. I went with a 24 inch LED uh, cool white light from Lowe's. Now just be aware that, that it is a little pricey. This unit was about $50 but it puts off plenty of light. I'm starting to build the cart to support the spray booth. I used two by fours and one by fours. Uh, there was a little lip. I drilled through the lip of the metal and screwed that into the wood so it's, it's attached. I didn't go too crazy with too many screws, so if I have to take it off, it's, it doesn't take too long. So I wanted this spray booth to fit fully underneath the fascia, so I, I tried to make the overall height 44 inches. But the problem was the space below to put the compressor kind of prohibited me from making it any shorter. So when I do the fascia on the next side of the layout, I'm going to have to live, leave a little space that's a little higher so it can slide underneath. So these are just little trade-offs that you have to make as you're going and you kind of learn as you go. Here we are mounting the wheels on the bottom, uh, just carrying that recurring theme throughout the layout room to make sure everything is very mobile so we can move it out and it's all nice and neat. Uh, all the wires will be all neatened up so it makes it easy to move around. So now I'm just going to put a little shelf on the bottom to hold the air compressor and I'm just using my brad nailer to, uh, to nail it in. So here we are down the layout room, I'm just taking the time to, you know, neaten up all the wires and tie them all up so they're not all over the floor and we're not tripping over them. Now I'm connecting up the uh, dryer duct to the uh, coupling in the ceiling. And then we're uh, just getting the spray booth set up and putting all our work stands and stuff in there. And the final step, just personalizing it with, with the stickers that I bought. So now we have a nice uh, work area to uh, spray paint in. Okay, so let me just say this. Uh, this spray booth was a little bigger than I anticipated, especially with the blower motor on the back. So I had planned um, for it to be in this little spot. So it's a little cramped where I am. Um, but, you know, going back to what I covered in previous episodes, uh, back in episode four of the construction series, I made sure to put everything on wheels and casters so that, you know, I could easily move everything out. And, and as you saw when I was setting it up, everything's all quick disconnects. So I can just roll this thing out of the layout room to make room for operating sessions. So um, what we'll do now is I'm going to go ahead and fire it up. So I made sure to fire everything up uh, through a central 
um, power strip. So you can hear the c compressor kicking on, so it's gonna bring it up to pressure. Um, the, uh, the fan's on and it's running and then the light comes on. Okay, so the, the compressor is up at operating uh, pressure and it, and it has the auto off feature. So this, this compressor was the one that I got uh, from Micromart. It's the Micromart style. It's very similar to the Posh uh, that they have um, on the, on the, in the catalog, but it's, it's a little cheaper. Um, so I just went with this. Uh, I really like it. It's very quiet, as you can see. So, and I like the auto on, on and off feature. So, and then it has a little tank in there that has a little reservoir, and that will take away your surging. So, um, when you use them little po pony pumps, they constantly run. You you notice you get a little pulsing sometimes. Well, with this air reservoir in here, you don't get any pulsing. It's just a constant flow of air. So, the blower comes on. Um, the the Dayton blower. Um, you know, I went with the Dayton blower because. This spray booth was initially designed by uh, Andy Sperano through Model Rarator. Uh, it was in the 1988, uh, January 1988 um, issue of Model Rarator. So Andy had designed to use a, the, a blower made by Dayton that put out approximately 245 CFMs. To, and they did, I guess he had some help with some engineers or something that did the calculations that figured at 245 CFMs, it was going to have the proper airflow to make sure that you don't have any particulate uh, that comes back out. So unfortunately, the, two, the Dayton 245 CFM blower was out, is no, has been discontinued, is no longer manufactured. But Dayton recommends this blower here, which puts out 235 CFMs. So I kind of, you know, didn't go with Andy's design. I changed it up a little bit, but I had, I had to because the next blower up was a uh, like a, a 400 CFM blower, and the pr price was considerably higher. So I just went with this one. So yeah. as you can see, it runs really well. Um, it, it's got a good suction. You can see it's pulling the uh, the air filter. The air filter is a 25 by 10 by one. Um, when I went to uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, they didn't stock the 25 by 10 by one. Um, it was actually a special order, so I got it off of the uh, the website. Or, uh, I got it off a website of it's a uh, it does uh, furnace filters. So go check it out if you decide to build this booth. Now, um, Bill Graham's cousin was a tin knocker. So what? If for those of you who don't know what tin knockers are, it's a trade um, that specializes in working with sheet metal, building duct works and piping for uh, you know the, the, the skyscrapers in um, in New York. So he was a tin knocker and he put this together and it was very, very well built, uh, made out of sheet metal. Um, all the, you can see all the edges he folded over so there's no sharp stuff. Um, it's all double folded where the seams come together. So this booth is like bomb proof. Uh, I'm telling you, it's, ve it's really well made. So, but I have seen people that have adapted Andy's design and made their spray booths out of wood. So there is no reason why you can't use wood. The other thing I'm going to cover is with the, the duct. So you see the duct in the back. I'm going to pan up for you just a little bit so you can see that duct. So that collar up there is a quick disconnect collar. Uh, I found those at Home Depot. Um, they're used for dryer vents and I really like them because they're easy to snap on and off. So I connected it up, up to the, um, the collar and I put a four inch hose clamp and tightened it down. There is no leakage up there as I can so far that I can tell. I, I went up there with some uh, feathers and stuff and I couldn't even feel anything. So, so. Uh, the last thing is I made sure to, uh, I put a little uh, piece of wood down here so I could put my clamp in for my stand so I can have my airbrushes in there. Uh, I got my, my work stands, uh, the rotisserie, so when you're spraying you can just spin them uh, to get all sides of your, uh, your work piece done. And uh, you also have uh, one of the clean out pots. So that's really handy. So when you run your airbrush cleaner through, you just stick it in the nozzle and you spray it. The liquid stays behind and the vapors get caught in the little filter in there. So it just help, it helps you so you don't get a ton of vapors that overwhelm this filter. So with this filter here, I don't know what the life expectancy is. So it's gonna be a trial and error basis. I do have a spare. They were relatively inexpensive. They were about $6 a filter. And I didn't go with the high end filters because if you look on, on the, um, websites or even Home Depot or Lowe's, there's like four different styles of air filter. Each one gets progressively more filtration, but I didn't want to put too much strain on the blower by sucking through a very thick filter. So I just went with the low, uh, the low grade filter. 
So, and then the last thing is, you know, I took the time to clean up the booth, uh, treat it. Um, I did a lot of wire wheeling because there was some, uh, corro uh, not corrosion, but some uh, scale buildup on the, on the galvanized metal. Um, I, then I sprayed it with a, a self etching pr uh, auto primer because the, um, with a bare metal surface, you want to, you want to etch it to give it a little tooth to grab your paint. And then I found this, uh, paint. It's a Rust-Oleum. It's called dark, uh, dark sea blue. And it just so happens that it's like a perfect match for the Conrail uh, color. So I, uh, that kind of worked out just by happenstance. And then I took the time to go on to Conrail Historical Society's uh, website and get some, some decals to dress it up. So, um, you know, this is going to be a free plug for the Conrail Historical Society. I'm a member and they are a great organization preserving the history uh, of Conrail. So if you're a Conrail fan, take the time to go over to, to CR, the CRH the crhs.org site and go check it out so i got these decals they were like a couple bucks i think they were like three or four dollars a piece i got a couple for the side and i put the, the ones across the top and um, they were nice enough because i ordered and they th threw in the free one so uh, i put them across the top so they everybody can see them um, you know got the uh, juniana locomotive shop painted uh, decal and then the remanufactured with pride and precision at Conrail at the juniana local local shop in Altoona PA so I put those up there kind of a uh, fitting tribute to the uh, Con the Conrail system in the juniana shops okay so I hope that was v uh, informative for everybody I hope you guys picked up some stuff because uh, I did a lot of research and uh, did a lot of uh, thinking about uh, setting this booth up so now I got a safe work environment so we can go ahead and get started working on some paint stuff. So next month, June, uh, for our shop series, uh, we're gonna go over to the locomotive shop and we're gonna get working on that GP20 that I've kind of been putting on the back burner. And we're gonna go ahead and put in the, uh, the WOW um, CNFN um, decoder. I'm also gonna get some detail parts because I wanna get some uh, Conrail specific details and, and install it on that GP20 uh, and just kind of make it, you know, a little more realistic. Then I'm gonna do a light weathering job. Um, well, I'm not going to do real heavy weathering on this unit. Uh, I'm going to kind of make it um, that it just came out of Juniana uh, from a rebuild. Uh, so it's just going to be a light weathering um, just to give it a little more realism. So that'll be June. Uh, that'll be the, uh, the locomotive shop. And then uh, July, uh, we're going to be back in the paint shop and uh, we're going to get working. I have Walther's, um, the intermodal well cars. Um, I'm going to be showing you how to take the numbers off and renumbering them. Uh, so I can have them all in uh, different numbers. So uh, I'll show you how to do that. So I hope everybody enjoyed that segment. Um, I, got, I did a lot of research and got a lot of material and threw it at you. So I hope you guys picked up some stuff and uh, that helped out a little bit. And if you're a first time viewer and you're seeing this for the first time uh, and you like this video, please subscribe to our channel so you can follow along because we're going to be doing a lot of uh, this stuff coming up and it's going it's to be a lot of fun. So with that being said, that's all I have for you this time. We'll see you next time on Central Jersey Conrail and Inscale. Thanks for watching.